Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. Most of the people in Maine live here for one of two reasons. Either they love to fish or they love to hunt. I'm kidding with you, of course, but the fact of the matter is that I don't know any man alive in these parts that doesn't do both on a regular basis. One of my personal favorite fishing spots is the Allagash River, in particular the Allagash Falls. The river provides some of the best trout and salmon fishing in the region, and in my opinion, There is nothing that can replace the sounds and the intensity of standing below the falls, fishing the suds for a real lurker. Mind you, we are not talking about Niagara here, but the falls is maybe 20 feet high and tumbles down over a somewhat series of steps as the river continues its way downstream. I was working the southwest corner of the pool on this particular day, with my rod tip pointing towards the northeast corner of the falls. The river and falls here are, for the most part, surrounded by pines, and the sound emanating from the falls is fairly loud, so much so that a black bear actually came out of the timber maybe 20 feet away from me one day unheard and scared me half to death. There was one pine on this northeast top section that stood out more prominently than the rest of the trees surrounding it, and for some reason my eyes were focused on that tree that day. Now, I must say that during most of the time I spend fishing, I am daydreaming more than anything else. Generally speaking, I snap out of it when a fish hits my line. I was standing on this rock, working my fly in the eddy of this pool, when my eyes caught a glimpse of something climbing up that particular tree. Frankly, I couldn't believe what my eyes were seeing. It appeared to be something along the lines of a small chimpanzee or gorilla climbing up and down the trunk of a tree. At times, it was swinging from limb to limb, paying no mind to me whatsoever as I stood below it, watching. I stood there, utterly consumed by its activities for several minutes before it descended the tree, moving out of my sight and into the trees below. I should also tell you that the tree it had been climbing stood 30 feet taller than anything around it, so when the creature made its descent, it was obscured by the 20 or 30 foot trees around it. Just as anyone else would have, I wondered what the hell a chimp was doing here. It just didn't make any sense. By the way, you couldn't just climb up there and have a look around. This thing was at the top end of the falls, which is all rock and rushing water, not to mention that it's on the other side of the river, so getting a closer look was not by any means an option. I must have been standing in the same spot for at least five minutes when, lo and behold, that little rascal starts climbing up the tree again. At one point, it was sitting on a limb in a squat, holding onto a branch above its head and looking at me squarely. The creature was completely covered in dark brown fur and the face appeared to be somewhat black. I say that I saw the belly because that area 
of its body was almost entirely devoid of hair moments later it swung down the tree from limb to limb like a circus acrobat and was once again out of my sight it repeated the cycle of appearing and disappearing for a period of about 45 minutes and now every time it went up it stopped to look at me knowing that i was now there i remember wishing that someone else would have come to the falls to share this bizarre event with me but that was not the case on this particular day i was looking at the trees below in anticipation of the creature's next climb when i was certain that i had seen something tall and dark moving behind the limbs below the area was so tightly packed with pines both small and large that all i could get was a fleeting glimpse of color i was waiting and waiting when on the other descending side of the falls a large beast came walking down through the trees with the little one sitting on its shoulder the slope which it was walking down was covered in smaller pines that were about six to ten feet tall at best and its head and shoulders stood proud of the highest trees by several feet about midway in its walk down the slope both the creatures turned to look at my way then disappeared into the forest i was flabbergasted at the sight of these two creatures passing by me this was obviously a juvenile and its parent out for a woodland stroll when i set eyes on the larger one i realized that the one i had been watching could have only been a yearling at best the larger beast stood several feet taller that the highest trees that it walked by making it some 13 to 14 feet in height according to my estimation i remember thinking that the head seemed somewhat small compared to the rest of it and it sat in a tucked down position between the creature's shoulders the larger creature was in no way holding on to the smaller one who was precariously sitting to one side of the adult's head on its shoulder with its hand on the adult's head this thing was so large that it would make a black bear look like a puppy dog in comparison i could see what appeared to be about four feet of the arm ending perhaps at mid forearm before it was obscured from view by the trees i now know that what i saw that day was a bigfoot and it has changed my entire outlook about being in the woods alone on to the next story i'm hector and i was born and raised in puerto rico but my family moved to miami when i was 16. miami was a new world for us and i was able to start taking classes there in photography which has always been my foremost interest i worked for many years in the communications business but now i travel with my wife and dog in an rv photographing the sights of america my photos have been in many books especially those about the national parks my wife and i both love to travel and we sold our house to make it more affordable we've traveled to alaska three times now and i have many photos of the wildlife there including bears moose and caribou but we especially enjoy going on day cruises in the kenai fjords national park and photographing the amazing sea life there especially the whales and dolphins i also love to photograph the shorebirds with puffins being my favorite 
We always drive our RV when we go to Alaska, and even though it's a long haul, we kayak and enjoy camping by the many lakes on our way through Canada. But the roads are no place to be in the winter, so my dream of photographing the Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights had always been just a wish. It's also too cold to be camping in our RV in winter when the long nights make the lights visible. But on my 55th birthday, my dream came true when my wife, Sally, gave me an envelope with my name on it. I couldn't believe it when I opened it. I thought it was a card with a little cash, but instead it was tickets to Fairbanks. And along with that ticket was a reservation with a dog sledder who takes people out to see the Aurora by sled, immersing you in the total beauty and silence of the Arctic at night. I was speechless. I not only would be taking photos of an entirely new subject which would improve my skills, but I would be seeing something I'd never seen before. I doubt if anyone has ever seen the Aurora where I come from in Puerto Rico. And I had no idea how different what I saw would be from what I expected. Incredibly different, but Given my penchant for, pho for photographing wildlife, it kind of fit me in a way, though I struggled for a long time about what I'd seen. So, my trip was planned for February, which is supposed to be one of the best times for viewing the Northern Aurora. The Aurora appears in the Auroral Zone, a band typically about 10 to 20 degrees from the magnetic poles. Magnetic storms can make the bands shift, which is why sometimes you can see the lights from lower latitudes, though it's rare. In the north, Fairbanks is one of the few towns along that band. There are other places where one can go, such as White Horse in the Yukon, but Fairbanks is the best for potential viewing. The Aurora Australis are the southern equivalent of the Aurora Borealis, and scientists have found they're the mirror image of their northern cousins. Since you don't see the Aurora every night, Sally had made me reservations for five days to increase my odds. My dog sled guide would take me out for one night, and if I wanted to go out the other nights I was there, I would have my rental car and could take myself out. The nice thing about the dog sled was we would be going into wilderness where light pollution would be non-existent. I was to find out that the Aurora is an absolutely stunning sight. After seeing it, I began to understand why people would spend so much money planning an entire trip to view it. It's impossible to forget the ethereal and otherworldly beauty. Before the trip, I read up a lot on the Aurora, but I forgot most of it, as it's fairly scientific. I like science, and as a photographer, I have to understand technical things, but the Aurora got into some advanced physics which can be hard to remember if you're not familiar with it. But basically, the lights are caused by electrons and protons that enter the atmosphere from the solar wind, which is a stream of charged particles that flows outward from the sun. These charged particles cause other particles in the Earth's atmosphere to admit light through ionization. That's about all I can remember, as it gets pretty complex. Well, I was pretty excited. And all I did the entire week before my trip was fiddle with my cameras and read about the Aurora on the internet. The University of Alaska has a website where you can see the Aurora forecast for each day, and I would check that all the time too. I was excited to see that no matter how much activity there was, Fairbanks always seemed to be in the thick of it. At the end of my trip, 
I actually went up and toured the Geophysical Institute on the hill above Fairbanks on the campus. It was very cool to see all their big parabolic radio antenna pointed at the sky. But I digress back to my trip, which was truly the trip of a lifetime in many ways as the Aurora was actually perhaps the lesser of the attractions. Let me explain. Sally and I were staying in an Arizona RV park at the time, so my flight to Fairbanks was a fairly long one. I arrived mid-afternoon, but by the time I got my rental car and found my hotel, I really didn't feel like doing much. I drove around town a little, had dinner, then headed back to my motel where I went to sleep, watching TV. I woke up around 4 a.m. and decided to go outside to see if the aurora was visible, but I didn't see anything, so I went back in and went to bed. The next day, I played tourist in Fairbanks, going to the Museum of the North where I saw lots of interesting things, including a stuffed polar bear. Then had lunch at the Alaskan Brewing Company, which was fantastic. They make a killer pizza there, and their coffee drinks are great. After that, along towards late evening, I met up with the fellow who was going to take me out by dog sled. I guess he would be what they call a musher. He came by my motel to pick me up. His name was Al, and he had six dogs in the back of his truck and a homemade dog box where each dog had its own compartment and could stick its nose out. I'm sure the mushers have a name for it, but I don't know what it is. The dogs were huskies, beautiful animals, friendly and eager to go. Al also had a big dog sled tied onto the top of the box. Al told me that the word husky came from the word huskimos, which is what early sailors called the Arctic people in general, aka Eskimos. I don't know if this is true or not, but it made for a good story. We drove quite a ways out of town for about an hour, out in the direction of the town of Circle. According to Al, Circle was named that because the original inhabitants thought they were on the Arctic Circle, though the actual Arctic Circle is a ways north. After a while, we turned off the highway and followed the road for a few hundred yards, then parked next to a small steamy pool that Al said was a hot spring. Circle has hot springs too, but it was another hour up the road. It was pitch black when we got there, and I do mean dark. We were lucky and had a perfectly clear sky and the sight of all the stars was just stupendous. I was wearing a warm down coat with a hood as well as a wool sweater, long johns, and a face mask. I was also wearing warm snow boots with heavy felt liners. I felt a rush of excitement like I was ready for anything. The dogs were excited too. Al told me he did this trip several times a week and taking tourists out into the bush to see the aurora was his main source of income during the winter. I was already getting cold just standing there waiting and wondering how long I could go before freezing. Al soon had the dogs hooked up and off we went. Well. I hadn't begun to explore the concept of being cold for riding on the dog sled created a wind chill that made it even colder. I had no idea where we were going and where we had been seemed good enough to me, but Al said we were going out to a very special place where we would experience the Alaskan Arctic at its best. I knew this was part of his marketing ploy and what attracted tourists to his tour. But the reality was we were already in the wilds and I kind of wanted to just stay where we were. I was feeling a bit uneasy, I guess, with the reality of how cold it was setting in. Al rode on the back rails of the dog sled and I rode on the sled itself. 
we glided over a snowy trail with banks some two or three feet high. The dogs seemed to know where to go, even though the only light was the starlight above us. It was a truly unique experience and reminded me of reading adventure books by people like Richard Proneck, the fellow who lived alone in the Alaska wilds in the 1960s, documenting it all with an 8mm movie camera. It was an interesting yet somewhat unnerving experience to be out in the Alaskan Arctic surrounded by nothing but deep snow, black spruce, and twinkling stars. And as we mushed along in the silence, my trepidations disappeared, and I felt a sense of deep peace. It was a moment in my life I'll never forget. Al mushed the dogs on a bit further until we came to a wide clearing, maybe a hundred feet in diameter, with a small lake in its center and surrounded by more black spruce. These are the short, slender trees that you see growing in the Alaskan tundra. They have narrow, pointed crown with short, drooping branches that have upturned tips. Al told me that the old-timers used to call them Q-tip trees because of their funny, bushy tops. This clearing was where we were going to spend the next several hours waiting and watching and hoping that the aurora borealis would make its appearance. The forecast had looked very good and Al was confident we would have an excellent showing. The clearing actually did seem pretty special, the perfect place for photographing the aurora. I could see now why Al brought people out here. I got my tripod and my camera gear out. I was wearing a pair of special gloves Sally had bought that were warm and yet flexible enough that I could still work my settings. After getting everything ready, we sat on the sled and waited, talking for a while, our voices gradually fading into silence. For some reason, it seemed like silence was safer, like there might be something out there that we would prefer didn't know we were around. My feelings of deep peace was gone, and I remember thinking at the time that it was odd to now be feeling nervous again, especially since there were no bears around, which would be my normal fear out in the Alaskan wilderness. They were all asleep, hibernating. I asked Al later if he had felt the same feeling of trepidation, and he said he had, and it was a first for him. He said he and his clients usually yacked on and on. He wondered if maybe it was because there might be a pack of wolves nearby attracted to the dogs. Finally, at around 2 a.m., the aurora finally began. I was so excited. I could barely get my camera oriented in the right direction, and I spent the next hour firing off long exposure shots using my tripod. I was freezing, but I didn't care. The lights were stunning, dancing and undulating in shapes of pale green and pink, the most common colors. It was truly one of the most moving experiences of my life. I took hundreds of shots. It was now 3 a.m. and the lights were beginning to fade. I knew we should get going as the cold was seeping into all my clothing. I could barely feel my toes and fingertips. Al had given the dogs a snack and they'd been curled up and sleeping in the snow while I was taking photos. I was beginning to feel sorry for them, though Al assured me they were used to the cold and their coats kept them quite warm. I began packing up my stuff when suddenly the lights began to intensify again. There was now a red streak running through the sky like a huge drapery, a giant curtain that moved as if some cosmic giant was slowly shaking it. I knew from my research that a red aurora was the rarest of all colors as it was caused when electrons strike oxygen atoms at higher altitudes which happen only and during intense solar activity. 
I'd hit the jackpot if I could get a good photograph of a red aurora. I could probably make enough money to pay for my trip. I quickly set my equipment back up and went back to work. Al was a good sport about it, saying we could stay out as long as I wasn't getting too cold. I had been starting to feel a bit sleep deprived, but my excitement quickly shook that off as I was again energized. High above, towering shafts of light moving back and forth across the horizon, oscillating back and forth in wide bands of crimson and deep magenta, I stood there quietly feeling like a mere speck of nothing in the vast expanse of the universe. Time ceased to exist as the curtains waved back and forth across the sky. I then realized I'd been staring at the sky so long that my neck was getting stiff. In fact, I'd pretty much forgotten where I was. I was so enthralled with the beauty in the sky. My attention quickly came back to earth when I heard a growl coming from one of the sled dogs. The dogs were on all their feet, looking into the trees at the edge of the clearing, and several were now making a low, rumbling growl like nothing I'd ever heard a dog make before. They actually sounded more like wolves than dogs. Al was on full alert, holding the dogs so that they wouldn't take off, though they didn't seem inclined to. He was also looking intently at the forest, trying to figure out what had the dogs so upset. He told me later that he thought a pack of wolves had come nearby. Hector, Al said, I think we might want to pack up and leave now. I detected a hint of fear in Al's voice, which made me shut it down and begin picking things up as quickly as possible. I had probably taken 500 shots of the red aurora, and I knew my odds of getting some good photos were excellent. Besides, I was literally freezing to death, and part of me was wondering about getting frostbite. I had no longer put my equipment away when the dog's growls turned into whines. Al, talking in a low voice to them, turned the sled around in the direction of home. I could see the dogs were very antsy, and it was all he could do to hold them back. I had no idea what was going on. Do you think there are wolves over there? I asked. Maybe, he answered, staring off into the trees. Maybe something else. My eyes followed his but it took a while to see into the darkness as I'd been staring at the red lights in the sky for some time. The entire landscape had a reddish tint to it, much like you would see during the first light of a brilliant red sunrise or the last minutes of a crimson sunset. The lake was reflecting so much red that it melted into the sky as its far shore giving an eerie endless appearance like a giant cosmic infinity pool. Trying to make out what Al was seeing, I thought I saw movement in the dark spruce, but it was hard to tell. There was no wind, but it seemed like several of the trees were swaying. The dogs were now acting terrified, trying to hide behind each other, tangling up in their harnesses. Staring hard into the trees, my eyes became more acclimated to the dark, and I could now see actual movement. Soon, I could see faint red lights like the glowing ends of cigarettes. Why would someone be way out here in the bush, standing around in the freezing cold, watching us and smoking? It made no sense. Next, I could hear the sound of sticks hitting against sticks, sounding kind of like when a snare drummer hits the rim of the drum, except there were several drummers. And, to top it all off, a low humming noise started up. Al sounded frantic. Get in the sled now. I was mesmerized and couldn't move. Get in the sled, Al yelled. Just as the dogs bolted, heading back down the trail, the sled jerking along behind them with Al holding on for dear life. I leaped for the sled, but was too slow. It had slid quickly and silently out of my reach, and I watched incredulously as the dark form quickly glided down the snowy trail we'd come in on. A deep, innate fear took hold of me. 
a fear I've never felt before or since, a fear much like a deer must feel, just as it feels the claws of the mountain lion clamp onto its back. The clicking noise was louder, and I knew whatever it was was coming towards me, leaving the trees and coming into the clearing. The humming was also louder and somehow deeper. I tried to run, but my heavy boots made speed impossible. Instead, I post hold through the trail into the snow up to my knees and fell forward, smashing my face into ice crystals. The sound of heavy footsteps crunching in the snow came up right behind me. I was afraid to look up, sensing imminent danger. As I pushed myself up from the snow, I must have somehow jammed something against the cell phone in my shirt for it started playing one of my ringtones, a piece by Beethoven. I was startled by how loud it was as the song played over and over. The figure next to me quickly turned and walked away, moving remarkably fast through the deep snow. I managed to get out of the snow and upright, continuing down the snowy trail at a desperately slow pace, sinking into the snow over and over. At least I didn't fall again, though keeping my balance was difficult. My ringtone played on and on, and to this day I can't stand the sound of Beethoven's Fifth, even though it may have saved my life as I have bad associations with it. Tediously half walking, half hopping, it seemed like it took forever to leave the meadow and get back to the patch through the trees. The forest, which had felt foreboding before, now felt somehow sheltering, as if maybe it would provide a place to hide. As the clicking gradually became more distant, the shock of being left in Alaska wilds, alone, on a blistering cold night began to set in. I just couldn't believe it. I finally turned off the ringtone, not wanting to run my battery down. I tried to dial 911, but had no signal. Walking through the deep snow was hard work, and I began to warm up some, my feet and hands now tingling. I knew I had several miles to go before I would get back to the hot springs and I doubted I could even make it, even if the strange creatures behind me left me alone. I began to picture Sally's face when she got the call saying I had died on the Alaskan wilderness. I knew she'd feel guilty, like it was somehow her fault, and I suddenly felt a desperate need to somehow get the message to her that it wasn't. Did I have any paper in my pocket, or a camera case? I then remembered that my camera was on the dog sled, which was probably back at Al's pickup by now, considering how fast they'd been going. Besides, even if I had something to write on, no pen on the planet would write in that bitter cold, as the ink would be frozen. I trudged on and on, sometimes seeing dark forms in the trees next to me, and sometimes hearing the sound of heavy footsteps crunching nearby in the frozen snow, but I no longer heard any clattering or humming. After a while, I went from sheer terror to a more haunting kind of fear, the kind that tells you you might die, but it will take a while because maybe you're being stalked. I suspected that my greatest danger was actually the cold, but at least hypothermia wouldn't be as painful as some kinds of death. I would just stop going, sit down, and go to sleep. Would the wolves feast on me, or maybe the strange creatures that I'd still seem to be following? After a while, I began to not care. I could feel my core body temperatures falling. It was desperate to somehow convey to Sally that this wasn't her fault and that I loved her. And I think that's what kept me going. I knew I was delirious when I suddenly saw a strange sight on the trail ahead. It looked like a dog sled stopped on the trail waiting for me. I tried to hurry but ended up falling instead. 
I no longer had the strength to pull myself out of the snow, and I knew I would soon die. But now, two strong arms were lifting me from the snow, and I knew it was Al. Hurry up, Hector. Get in the sled before the dogs take off again. He dragged me onto the sled, and the dogs were soon running the sled, tipping dangerously when the trail turned. I could hear Al yelling and cussing at them to slow down, but they kept on. They had to be exhausted. When they suddenly stopped, I knew we reached Al's truck. Al helped me get into the cab where he started the truck and turned the heater on high. He then unlocked the dogs and put them in their boxes quickly in the biting cold. He didn't say a word until we were back on the highway again. I could see he was shaking even though the cab was now warm. I knew he'd been just as cold as I was. It seemed we'd both barely sidestepped death. I'm really sorry for leaving you back there, he said. The dogs bolted, and I couldn't stop them. They totally ignored me, even with the set, even with the sled brakes on. They just dragged it forever until they got tired. Whatever it was back there scared them to death. All I could do was wait and hope you came out, as there was no way they would turn back. I nodded. It was okay. Too tired to talk. Finally, I asked, is my camera okay? Yeah, it's behind the seat. We were soon back in Fairbanks, where Al dropped me off at the motel. The outside thermometer by the office read minus 42 degrees. You'll be okay, he asked. Yeah, I'm fine, as long as I don't forget my camera. I have a feeling those photos will be worth all of this. I smiled, trying to show him I wasn't going to hold any grudges, especially about something he had no control over. I can refund your money if you want, he added. No, it was worth every penny, Al. It was, one of, it was the trip of a lifetime in more ways than one. I held out my hand and we shook. Neither of us mentioned what we'd seen. After he left, I crawled into bed, totally fatigued, both mentally and physically. I, re I reveled in the I reveled in feeling safe and secure, aware of how lucky I'd been, and now keenly appreciating everything I had. The next morning, I downloaded my photos with awe. They'd turned out great. I was ready to go home. I called Sally, happy to hear her voice. I didn't tell her about what had happened. I had been in Fairbanks for two nights by then, and I had three left. I wasn't sure what to do, as I just wanted to leave and go home. But if I did, it would cost to change my ticket. It would cost to change my ticket, and I'd already paid for the motel, so I decided to stay. Maybe I could get more photos of the Aurora some violets and blues, assuming I had the courage to go out in the dark again. I did more sightseeing around town that day, going down to the Chenna River and looking at the riverboat, as well as finding a jewelry store where I bought Sally some pretty white earrings shaped like polar bears. That evening, I decided to try again for the Aurora, as the university website said, we were still in the middle of very high auroral activity. There was no way I was going out towards the hot springs again, so I decided to go up on Chenna Ridge above the university. It was close and, they were, and there were houses up there, so I didn't figure I would see anything weird. I went out around 1 a.m. and pulled off on a long drive that went back, into, that went back to a nice house. I stayed in my car until I finally saw the lights appear overhead. Then I got out and set up my equipment. Then I got out and set up my equipment. I did some nice shots, but I did have but I have to admit that my fears overcame me. I started seeing shadowy figures everywhere, and the horror of the previous night came back in full force until I had to leave. I suddenly lost interest. 
I was tired and decided to get a good night's sleep, then return to Arizona the next day even though I'd have to pay for the flight change. Besides, it was too cold and I hadn't really recovered from my night in the wilds. I just didn't have the stamina to stay outside looking at the night sky, beautiful as it was. I was soon on a plane home, very happy to see Alaska in the rearview mirror. And I can't tell you how happy I was to see Sally again. One thing it taught me was that there are many things out there we don't yet know about or understand. I feel that Bigfoot is one of these. Lots of stories portray them as being simply curious and not really dangerous, though territorial. But there's one aspect of Bigfoot that I got a glimpse of that night, an aspect that people tend to forget. Bigfoot really is a member of the ape family, as we humans are. Then it stands to reason that it has the capacity for doing harm, as most apes are capable of doing very bad things. I'm not saying Bigfoot are dangerous, just that the jury's out. I'm convinced that the Bigfoot I'm convinced that the Bigfoot that I saw that night could have easily harmed me if they'd wished, yet they didn't. Why? I'll never know. Maybe it was the uncertainty of hearing my cell phone that made them pause. Maybe they would have ripped me to shreds otherwise. I just don't know. How do I really know that they were Bigfoot since all I saw were shadowy figures? Well, when I got home, I downloaded all my photos onto my large monitor and studied them. As I scanned through them, I realized I'd photographed the strange figures without knowing it. There, among the shapes of the black spruce, stood half a dozen shadowy figures. Their glowing red eyes stood out clearly, lending the scene a weirdness that goes beyond words against that background of blood red sky and it appeared that a couple of them were holding sticks high into the air possibly the source of the clacking sound i heard as i zoomed in on the photos it became clear what they were they fit the description perfectly of bigfoot broad shoulders conical heads large bulky size and glowing eyes even though the images were dark and shadowy it was obvious I was stunned. I knew I'd been trying to repress the memory, but it's hard to ignore photographic evidence. And there it was, proof that Bigfoot exists. Proof enough for me anyways. I thought about it for many days, then decided not to share the photos with anyone, not even Sally. Something made me reluctant to do so. Something made me reluctant to want to show them to anyone, and I don't understand why, but I felt a deep need to keep it all to myself. Of course, Al knew, and he was free to do what he wanted, but I somehow knew he wouldn't say a word either. I kept the photos for a good month, then erased the figures in Photoshop, deleting them. Leaving only the blood-red sky, I decided I didn't want Sally to ever see them. I knew she would be terrified and would ask questions. I had no interest in ever discussing it again with anyone. My decision brought me peace, though I can still sometimes hear the clattering noise when the wind blows just right. Maybe it's just the leaves blowing across the roof of our RV, but it always brings back a memory I'll never forget. A memory of the truly most unforgettable things I've ever seen. Glowing blood red eyes under a glowing blood red sky. I hope you enjoyed those stories. If you did, be sure to hit that like button and be sure to subscribe. I post new videos every Thursday, so if you hit that notification bell, you'll be notified when they go live. Again, thank you so much for watching this video, and until next time, bye!